Hi everyone, welcome to The Homegrown Artist. My name is Barbara and today we're going to be doing a review of the um, Dr. P.H. Martin's Hydra's Fine Art Watercolors. Um, these I've had for about three years now and I absolutely adore them. Um, they're very, very concentrated uh, liquid watercolors and um, they're very light fast. Now these are very different than the Dr. P.H. Martin Indian inks which are actually made from Indian inks. Uh, or India inks, and then the Dr. P.H. Martin's Radiant inks. Um, those are actually made from dye, so they are not light fast at all. These, however, are actually made from pigments, and I have the pig pigment information that I'll show you when I do the swatch. Um, and they are all light fast. All, the, all of the colors in their range are all light fast, either equivalent to the ASTM rating of 1, which is excellent, or 2, which is very good. Um, and if you can see right here, if it'll focus there, it says it conforms to ASTMD. And uh, it also says some stuff about the paint. So it says it's light fast and transparent, brilliant, permanent pigments, blendable, intermixable. So that means, blendable means they blend together very well. Intermixable means that you can mix them with other watercolors. And high density just means that because they are so concentrated, they are very dense. And so... Um, they'll sink down, uh, which also kind of makes them flow a little bit different than normal watercolors. Um, so it depends on what technique you're using, how well they'll, they'll flow. So that's something we'll um, concentrate on on the swatch and stuff in a little bit. Um, so yeah, they are very light fast. If you can see that. And a lot of people think that because they're so opaque looking in the bottle that they're not transparent watercolors, but that's just because they are so, so concentrated that you really do have to water them down to make them pigmented. And I'll show you how using them straight from the tube or close to straight from the tube compared to watered down makes a difference uh, later. So first of all, what we're going to do is we are going to actually do some swatches. Uh, but I want to actually show, tell you that these I didn't get from any sets. They do come in different sets. I think there's three sets now. Um, three sets of 12. Uh, so there's, what, 36 colors in their range? I'm guessing uh, based on the three sets of 12. Um, and uh, you can get them in one ounce bottles like this. They all come in um, glass bottles with the little eyedropper thing here. Sometimes they're hard to open where you can drop the pigment if you wanted to. And then um, the other size is a half ounce and um, it's uh, 15 milliliters. This one is one ounce and is 30 milliliters. Um, but they all come in glass bottles with the eyedropper. Um, and then in the set you get like a little circle thing and it's, it kind of acts like a palette. I, however, didn't purchase that. I actually got these when an art store in Mobile was um, getting rid of their stock of these, I guess because they weren't going to hold them anymore. So they had them at $4 each, which is a great price because even for when you buy them in sets uh, of 12, they either come, f um, depending on when you purchase them and where you purchase them, they're around like $60 to $70 all the way to $100, $120. So it all depends on when you get them and where you get them. Um, so I think if you shop, uh, smart with, cu with coupons or when sales go on, you can get them for around $65, $70 for 12 of them. But I got these, I got, let's see, 3, 6, 12, 15, 18 of them for $4 each, um, which I can't do math in my head right now. Uh, let's see, 12 times 4 is 48, so already that's cheaper than um, than buying it in the set. So I got it at a, a pretty good discount, which is great. But I didn't get to pick the colors. I just got one each of every color that they had because I thought it was a really great deal. Um, and I learned later that picking the colors that you get um, comes in handy just based on the pigment. If you're a pigment enthusiast, uh, then you'll probably want to buy them separately and pick the colors that you want because you don't need all the colors that come in the set because some of them are just mixed um, pigments already mixed together in a set uh, or in a bottle so you don't necessarily need that and we'll cover that a little bit more once we get into the swatching which we are going to do now so I'm going to move these aside and try to keep them in order of how I want to swatch them 
All right. So I made this little chart here. Let me zoom in a little bit on it. Um, so I have the name of the color there and the pigment information. And right here, I'm going to do just a little swatch. And over here, I'm going to show you how they kind of flow out and everything. Um, so basically, all I'm going to do is, if you can see all this pigment right here, generally, that's ha what happens when you store them. I store mine on the side um, for two reasons. One, it's easier. I can put them in a drawer. And two, that's how they come in the package when they're sold. So I, I'm guessing that's kind of how they, they want you to store them. Also because if you store them upright, I think that a lot of the pigment will settle down at the bottom. And then if when you go to like suction it up, if you had forgotten to shake it, shake it up or something like that, then you'll be sucking up tons and tons of that pigment and that's not something that you want. But all you have to do is just kind of twirl it around like this, shake it up against your hand. I wouldn't shake it up and down like this really fast because then you'll create bubbles. And just kind of get that pigment from around off the side of the bottle. It may take a little while for the shaking. I left this one unshook. I shook most of them up before starting, but I left this one undone just so that you could see how the pigment kind of sticks to the side. But you can still use it even if the pigment still stuck to the side because then um, it's not as concentrated. <laughs> and then if you have a lot of pigment stuck left at the bottom, or left on the side later when you think that you're empty you can just add water to it and reconstitute it and you still have a lot of paint to work with. Alright, so I got that off the side there and what I'm going to do is I am going to put a little drop here and then I'm also I'm going to leave that open for a minute because I'm also going to wet this and put some of that color in there to show you how it flows. So this is the color straight from the tube. I, I patted my brush off on a paper towel first. So you can see how concentrated that color is. It's or not straight from the tube, straight from the bottle, straight from the eyedropper. And you can see how amazingly concentrated that is. Um, so it's basically like if you were to squeeze out a tube of wet paint using it straight like that is basically what it is. They are very, very concentrated. I'm going to try to pull some of that color down here. Alright, so that is Hansi Yellow Light uh, made with PY3, which most Hansi Yellow Lights are made out of. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a nice juicy brush and wet this area here. Make sure it's nice and moist and has that sheen on it. And then I'm going to show you how the colors flow. So this one right here doesn't flow as much as the other ones, but it does still kind of burst out just a little bit on the page there. Um, Alright, so the next color we're going to go over is New Gamboge. And it is made with PY65, which I think is basically Hansi Yellow, um, Hansi Yellow Deep, I think is the, the color there. And uh, it's a very beautiful color. Um, I really, really love this yellow. It's a very beautiful, warm, um, warm yellow. And it's very transparent. Um, like most Hansa Yellow Lights, um, that one is semi-transparent. It's not really opaque, but it's not like super transparent either. Um, so that's something to be aware of. The pigment itself is semi-transparent to semi-opaque, depending on how it's treated. But this color is so beautiful, especially when it's watered down. It's just a bright and vivid, almost like golden yellow. It's, it's so pretty. All right, so now we're gonna do a little bit of water. And then drop a little bit of that color in there. You can see how that kind of bursts out and flows. And the thing where it said high density, and this is where it comes into play a little bit. 
when you drop it, a lot of the pigment is going to fall down really quickly because it is so dense. Um, it's more dense than water, so it's going to drop. But then also, because there's so much pigment, it's also going to like burst out a little bit. And you can see over here how it's flowed, it's flowed across the page more than where I put it. Um, so that's really good for like uh, if you are doing pouring techniques or you just want like a loose kind of watercolor background or something like that. Alright, so the next color is Chrome Yellow, which is also made with PY65, but they, I guess, treated it a little differently. So it's more of an orange color than a yellow color. Um, when you water it down, it kind of looks a little bit more yellow. So I guess this one kind of looks, I mean, it looks like Gamboge, but if you were go, going based on, say, like Daniel Smith watercolors or something like that, then this would be Hansy Yellow Light, Hansy Yellow Medium, and Hansy Yellow Deep. This one's a little bit more orange than Hansy Yellow Deep, though. Which is why I guess they call it Chrome Yellow. <laughs> but they are all very, very pigmented. Beautiful colors. I love them so much. Um, these colors are great for people who really, really like bright colors. But you can also use them um, to with complementary colors and mixing. And you can make more toned down colors. And in the different sets, which I only got one brown. I don't have a white, a black, or any of the other browns or the ochres or anything like that. Um, so I can't show you those, but, um, you do get natural colors in a set, which I have on my wish list, um, set two, which has a lot of the natural colors in there. And, um, oh, you see how pretty that is? I love that effect. It just bursts out. Um, and then like the white, because the white in mixed media, whenever you're playing around with that, say you're creating a background with the hydrous watercolors, you get like beautiful effects because of the density of the color it just kind of like flows out and it's just it's so pretty um, alright so the next color is permanent red which is made with two pigments PR 188 which is basically I think naphthol scarlet um, or vermilion type color and then PR 70 PR 170, that's a typo there, um, but it's supposed to be PR 170, which is basically naphthol red. So this was just made to create kind of like a um, uh, orangey red color. And uh, it's a very pretty red. And th this is a color that whenever I bought it I noticed that it was kind of chunky inside of the tube and I'll show you that if you can see kind of the chunks on the um, dropper uh, the thing with that is is basically a lot of it has dried out a little bit and so there's little chunks and stuff in there all you have to do is just wet it and kind of mix it up and it works just fine blend that out just a little bit better but I did buy these um, I guess the store had them for a while and I don't know something happened that they they wanted to get rid of them but they're wonderful watercolors so I don't know why maybe there was some controversy going on about them or something like that oh I forgot to do a little water test So you want to use a good amount of water whenever you want these to flow, otherwise they don't flow as much. If you don't have as much water on your, um, on your paper, because they are so pigmented, they don't flow as much. And this one, I don't know if it's because it's kind of messed up a little bit, or maybe I didn't have a lot of water as I was talking about making sure you have a good amount of water. Um, I don't know if it's because it's chunky a little bit or what's going on, but it does not have as much flow 
as the other colors. If you can see that there. So, and that, it may be um, just because of how I bought it. Um, I don't have a newer version of this to compare it to, so maybe the newer ones that you get in sets now um, are completely different than this right here. But you can see kind of the little chunks like in the paint there. And I don't know if after, I mean I've had these for three years and some of them are perfectly fine. I don't know if after a while some of them, um, some of them start to do that just from drying out or something like that. I'm not sure. So this is uh, Carmine, which is PR 170, which is basically naphthol red. Um, so it's a little bit cooler red than the permanent red. So it's kind of, I would say, like a, a neutrally red compared to um, like the pinker colors we're fixing or about to get into. I say fixing a lot and I feel like I sound really country, which I am from the south, so <laughs> that makes sense. But you still get that vibrant color even when they're watered down, so that's really cool. But this is more of a pink-based red, um, borderline neutral red. And then let's try the flow. I know this one flows because it's one of my favorite to use when making the colors flow. It just kind of like burst out. It's so pretty. All right, so the next color is Deep Red Rose, which is made with PR269, and I could not find any information on handprint.com about what that pigment is, but basically it's like a, um, a purpley red. Um, and then PR170, which would be this Carmine. So it's kind of a mixture of, um, of those together. So if you had an option to just buy like the PR188 to have your warm red and then the PR170 um, by itself and the PR269 by itself, which would be the Crimson Link, which I'll show you later, um, then that I would do that just because you can mix this color and you can mix this color if necessary. But if you're not that worried about pigments and stuff like that and you want them already pre-mixed and stuff, then go ahead and buy all of them if you want them. This is a very purpley, pinky color. Very pretty. It's one of my favorite colors. It's so pretty. It almost looks like Opera Rose. Um, whenever you water it down some, like right here in this area, it almost looks like Opera Rose. So if you're a big fan of Opera Rose, but you can't, don't want to use it because it's not light fast, then get this Deep Red Rose, because it's a very bright and vivid pink. And they do have a drying shift, if you can tell um, from this, even on all of them where I'm doing the wet and wet technique um, compared to where I did a little drier you can tell there is a little bit of a color shift there this one's gonna oh it didn't burst out normally it does we'll have to play around with how the colors burst out but it still flows out a little bit and then let's see what happens if we put like a drop of water into that there we go. And so you have to play around with the density because they are so highly dense. The amount of water that you have affects the flow. All right, so now we are going on to Crimson Lake, which like I said, um, is the same pigment that's in there, PR269, which is a more purpley, pinky red. And Do the same thing, pull that down. It's 
very, very close in hue to the um, Deep Red Rose, but um, more purpley, more pinky. Actually, this one's kind of closer to Opera than the other one. Like right here, if you can see that, you probably can't because I'm, I'm off the page there. But it's so bright right here, it's ridiculous. This one, as it dried, lost its intensity. Let's see if that one does. And then we are going to water this area down. And then drop in this color, which in my experience, this color also flows. I don't know if it's going to... Yep. <laughs> it's so pretty when it does that. Oh, I love that effect. Alright, so now we're getting to Ultramarine Red Violet, which anytime I hear Ultramarine, I think of PB29, I think is the pigment, yes. Um, and in both Ultramarines, there is no PB29. They actually use Thalo Blue. Um, I don't know why I have PY65 here. That is a big, big typo. But Ultramarine in their set is PV19 and PB15, which is kind of a weird, I mean it's weirder than Mission Gold's um, Ultramarine that has PB19 in it, but it also has PB29, which is the actual pigment for Ultramarine. But anyway, we're going to do the color swatches and see how they react. We'll see if it granulates. I don't know if it granulates, how they got it to, I mean like, I've tested out the granulation and I have seen um, this color granulate a little bit. Not quite as much as other colors, like um, other brands of Ultramarine that actually have the PB29 in it. But um, I have seen it granulate. I don't know if that was my imagination because I expected it or what, but look at this purple. It's very pretty. And it does look like an Ultramarine. Um, violet hue and see it's kind of granulating as well I don't know how they got that to happen can you see the granulation kind of going on there like that's crazy to me but it has absolutely no ultramarine in it whatsoever. It's made with phthalo blue and then PB19. The same color that the, the ultramarine blue is made out of. Which again is crazy. And to me the ultramarine doesn't actually look like an actual ultramarine. It looks kind of like just a warm blue. Let's see if that one flows out. Not really. So some of the colors have extreme flow and some of them do not. Let's see what happens when we add water on the top of that. They flow out pretty well when you add water on the top. And I'm, I don't know if this is my imagination or not, but I'm seeing granulation there. Alright, so we're going to do the ultimate test, which would be the ultramarine. Which you can tell like from the bottle that it looks kind of phthalo -y, if you can see that there. Um, but it is a warmer blue than their phthalo blue. Oh, I just mixed a little bit of that, that purple in there but that's okay. It's very, very pigmented, and it looks like basically a phthalo blue red shade, although the red part of it is the PB19, which um, could be any type of like red or purple color. Um, but it is warmer than their actual phthalo blue. And it does have these little areas that, that granulate, like... I'll put some water down there so you can see. I don't know how they got it to granulate like that. Like this one right here, you can see some granulation there as well. 
I don't know how they did that. Is there a medium that makes things granulate? There probably is. I just don't know about it. Let's see how this one flows. I think the uh, more granulating pigments don't flow. Well, it flows, apparently, but um, with high pigment loads, maybe it doesn't flow as well as the more transparent colors. Because, I mean, they're all transparent, but they're... That flows, just not not like some of the other ones. Let's add some water on top, see what happens. I mean, it flows out, just not like the bursting effect of some of the other colors up here. All right, so now we are moving on to Thalo Blue, which is the PV15. I love Thalo Blue. It's a very good mixing color, along with Thalo Green. So you can see this one is much warmer than the ultramarine that's made with the phthalo blue but has the um, red or red violet color mixed in. So definitely, definitely much cooler than this one, but this one doesn't really look like ultramarine. I'll have to show you when it dries that there are some little granulating particles in there. I don't know how that happened. Please someone explain to me how they did that. It, it has to be something that you put in your colors to make them granulate. I guess I just, I haven't researched that area enough. All right, let's see if this flows out. It flows just again not like the ones that kind of like burst out and everything all right so turquoise blue is the next color it's made with PB 15 which is this and then PG 7 which we'll see later so basically it's like most turquoises made with phthalo green and phthalo blue um, so it's basically just a little bit more green than this one right here so this is a cool blue um, so this one's gonna be even cooler in temperature um, because it has that green in it. Oh, it's such a pretty color. Very pretty color. All right, and then we're gonna do the flow test. I'm guessing it's gonna flow similar to these. Like, um, as you can see, they're flowing out as time goes on. So with watercolor, it's always best to let things kind of work on their own. That's why I don't blow dry a lot of my watercolor um, work, unless it's absolutely necessary or I'm filming in a video and I want things to dry quickly. Um, just because things flow out at their own rate and uh, I like to see how the watercolor works on its own. So we'll see how that one does. Let's see if it flows out a little better if I put water on top. Probably will. All right, so the next color is Blue Aqua, which is basically the same mixture of, of this, except for there's more PG-7 in it than there is PG-15, so it's gonna be more of a green shade than a blue shade, according to the pigment information. We'll see how it compares. Um, so for these colors, it wouldn't actually be necessary to get these two colors. Um, you could just get these two colors, the PG-7 and the PG-15, and kind of mix your own blue aqua or your own turquoise um, colors. But this is a very pretty color. They're very pretty, so I'm, like if I had a choice, even though I know that it's easy to mix the colors, I would still get these because having them already mixed in a eyedropper is just 
an excellent thing, especially if you're doing loose paintings or you're doing like uh, the pouring technique, which you're not really pouring, you're just eyedroppering it. Um, then it comes in handy to have the already premixed colors and the eyedroppers. Alright, let's see how this one flows out. So in different brands, both of these would be considered turquoise. Like in Grumbacher Academy, their tur turquoise looks like this. I think it's made with the same pigments. And then like in um, some other brands, like Daniel Smith's turquoise, I think is closer to this color than it is to this color. And it, it does, after a while, flow out pretty well. You just have to learn to work with it. All right, so now we get to phthalo green, which is what these two colors have in them to make them more um, cooler green tones, our values. Make sure I'm on camera here. All right, so phthalo green. This is a color that um, I think I've actually done a kind of like highlight on this pigment um, because it's a very in your face kind of bright and vivid green compared to a lot of the other greens but in this this brand in the hydrus it's kind of more yellowy than it is in a lot of and some other or at least my Daniel Smith uh, version just trying to pull that color down some all right, and then let's see how that flows. Now I am using a student quality paper. I'm just using the Canson XL watercolor paper, so it may flow differently on artist quality paper. Matter of fact, I know that it flows differently on artist quality paper, but you still get that flow effect on the student quality paper, so. I just wanted to show you that. I'm not going to touch that with water and I'm going to see how it flows out. So the next color is Viridian Green, which is absolutely not Viridian Green, just like Ultramarine is not the actual pigment for Ultramarine. Viridian Green is made with PG18 um, and is granulating and um, a much lighter hue than this. And this one's made with PY3, which would be Hansy Yellow Light, and then PG7, which is this one right here. So it's just, it's kind of like um, the um, permanent greens and stuff that you can get in artist quality colors. Or like, if it had more yellow in it, it would be compared to like permanent green light. So if you wanted to, you can mix up more of that Hansy Yellow and create your own permanent green light. Um, they're so, so pigmented, it's crazy. Alright, so you can see how it's very similar to this color, but you can tell there was yellow mixed in. And then... We have to do the little flow test there. I wonder how this one's going to flow. I don't use a lot of the greens, these two greens, unless I am toning something down or I'm mixing this green with either more yellow or more blue. So um, I haven't really tested the flow just because I don't use it on its own. We'll see at the end how it works. And then the last color that I own is Burnt Sienna, which is PBR7. It does not say it on the bottle, but um, you can ask uh, Dr. P.H. Martins to send you a list of the pigments and all of like the raw sienna, burnt sienna type colors, um, burnt umber, raw umber, are made with PR7, PBR7 which in my mind is a great thing because I like 
that's the natural pigment for um, those browns and they're just treated differently. Um, I like it a lot better than PR 101. I, I love PR 101. I love the color that they, that you get with the um, like Windsor and Newton burnt sienna where you get that kind of like golden orange type color but I like this version of burnt sienna a little bit better. So when I go and reach for that burnt sienna brown, I know it's not going to be orange. It's going to actually be that reddish brown, like oxidized brown sh uh, shade. If that makes any sense at all. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Alright, let's see how that flows. And you can see, let me add a little bit of water to this so I can see if it granulates uh, any. Alright, see how this one flows out. So it has flow, um, it just doesn't burst out like the reds and a couple of the yellows do. So like the, uh, let me zoom out a little bit, if you look at the, um, maybe zoom out a little bit more, like the Gamboge, the Chrome Yellow, the Carmine, Deep Red Rose, Crimson Lake, um, those colors just kind of burst out right when you put them on the page, which is awesome. Um, the other ones take a little bit more time to kind of flow out, uh, but I, I really, really love the ones that kind of like burst out like that. And also, if you can see, they must have added some kind of granulating um, additive because the ultramarine red violet does granulate, and uh, the ultramarine blue doesn't granulate as much as the purple. And then the burnt sienna does granulate as well, which that's the pigment granulates itself. Um, but it's weird that the ultramarine red violet doesn't have a granulating pigment in it, but it does kind of granulate a little bit. Hmm. All right, guys, now that we have gone over the color swatches of the colors that I do have and seeing how they flow, and act, uh, react with the water and everything. What I'm going to do is pretty much the same watercolor test that I do with most of the watercolors that I am going over. And that is, I will actually zoom in a little bit on this for you. So, <coughs> excuse me, the color blending and everything. And this was just me wetting an area of the page and dropping the color in. So I dropped in yellow, um, Hansy Yellow Light, Thalo Blue, um, the Crimson Lake, which is your closest to magenta color, and then the yellow again, and just let them spread out. The only thing I did with the paintbrush was I took a very juicy paintbrush and just kind of pulled it down with water so you can see some of the lighter versions that you can get with the mixes. And as you can see, they mix beautifully. You can get really dark colors if you want to. Um, you can get them to lighter versions if you want to, and they're just gorgeous. So, um, without much trouble um, mixing, just dropping the colors in, they blend very, very well. So like it said on the bottle, very blendable. Um, and then I'm also going to go in with a water brush and do kind of a lifting test because even though these are made with pigments and seem like semi-traditional watercolors, they are more heavily staining than a lot of other watercolors. Um, so even the colors that are supposed to lift up, like um, the granulating colors or non-staining colors like burnt sienna, that's the only one out of my color chart that is actually made with PBR7, which is a non-staining color. Uh, the ultramarine, which would be my other option, is made with a staining color, so uh, I didn't want to use that one there. And I'll show you kind of an example of that later, but we're going to try to lift a little bit here and I'm going to scrub, 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 scrub and I'm scrubbing quite a bit. This is a non-staining color and as you can see, I mean this is a staining color and as you can see it didn't lift up hardly at all. So what you have to do with the staining colors 
uh, with most colors on here is um, go with a scrubby brush. If I go really lightly like I would on a student quality paper, I would get barely anything back at all. So as you can see, it still didn't, didn't lift very much at all. I'll zoom in a little bit more. But if I did want to lift it up, and I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this on a student quality paper, so that's something you want to remember, is if you want to do subtractive painting by lifting things out, after it's dried, you're going to have to use a scrubby brush. So if you want to do that kind of painting, you will have to use artist quality paper that can take that damage. So if I scrub a little bit harder and damage that paper a little bit, then I can get back to the white of the paper. Um, and it's very similar with the... Um, with the burnt sienna, which is a granulating and non-staining color, I should be able to lift it up quite a bit. So I'm scrubbing, 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 scrubbing with the water brush. And then I go in to lift it up and barely anything has lifted up. Um, it lifted up more than the phthalo blue did, but not as much as a normal um, non-staining color would lift up. So again, with the uh, scrubby brush, I think I'd be able to lift it up a little bit more going in gently. So yeah, lift it up a little bit more going in gently. So with the non-staining colors or pigments, you can go in with a scrubby brush on student quality paper and not have a problem damaging your paper as much. Um, but then to get it back completely to white, you do have to scrub, scrub, scrub and damage that paper a little bit to get it back completely to white. So they're not very easily lifted. They're very staining colors including the non-staining colors. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit more on this piece of paper. So say I wanted, um, I think what I'm going to do is just miss this area a little bit right here and I'm going to put their ultramarine which is not uh, um, non-staining pigment in their version. See it flows beautifully on there. I think it's just the amount of water. You need more water for it to flow all crazy. And then I'm going to put some burnt sienna on there as well which would be their version of non-staining color and I'm probably gonna have to um, move that around a little bit with a brush. So just move it around and if you can see how even the burnt sienna, even though it doesn't have the granulating pigments in there, it's still, I mean not the burnt sienna, but the ultramarine, even though it doesn't have those granulating pigments in it, it still granulates just a little bit. And I honestly don't, I'm going to have to research that and find out what you can add to watercolors to make them granulate. So this is just a big giant lifting test basically. So if I wanted to lift some color, I'm going to move this around. So this one is more staining so I'm going to go in really quick even though it's ultramarine um, and while while paint is wet you're supposed to be able to lift it back up to white pretty easily um, but because this ultramarine is a um, mixture of, a, of staining colors it doesn't lift up back to white. Uh, so let's try with the burnt sienna while it's wet if you can lift back to white. And on, especially on student quality paper, where paints lift up a lot easier, I should be able to get this burnt sienna back to white, and yet I, I can't do that. Um, so you can tell they are very staining colors. Um, the cool thing about the ultramarine is that when you do lift some of the colors up, I guess the purple in it um, floats down a little bit more, and so when you lift it, you get the um, kind of little areas of purple shining through right there. I mean, I lifted it enough to make clouds, so that's not a problem, but if I wanted to lift it completely back to a white cloud, uh, that's not going to happen because they, they do stain quite heavily. Um, some other things that you can do with the Hydrus watercolors, um, so you can use them like a normal watercolor with a paintbrush. You can also put them in your technical pens, so um, like for drafting and stuff like that. Uh, Let's see, let me give you an example of a technical pen. I have a refillable, okay. So this is a technical pen, this is a Copic marker. Normally they have um, actual um, refillable techn technical pens, which mine is not on hand right now. But you can put these in those pens and paint with them. And because they're so staining, once they're dry, they're almost waterproof. So you can do that, uh, which is really cool. 
Um, and then you can also put them in dip pens and stuff like that. So let me find a dip pen. I think I actually have a dip pen. I think I do. This is the Pilot It has not been refreshed in a while. So this is the Pilot Parallel Pen. Um, it's not really a dip pen. It can be considered a technical pen, but it's a calligraphy pen. And this is actually watercolor in there. It's the Hydra's watercolor and the purple, ultramarine violet purple, but watered down. You can also put them in... Uh, I have no idea where my nib is right now, but you can put them in, sorry, in pens like this, the little nibs, the calligraphy nibs, and dip into this, or you can put it in a well and mix it to the consist consistency that you want and do calligraphy with the pens. Um, you can also use a water brush like this, and I'm just going to use the ultramarine just because it is, or actually I'll use this palette real quick. Just use this red. So you can take whatever concentration you want, but when you're using brush pens that have water in them, basically what you're going to get is a highly concentrated color when you start off and it's going to fade as you go. But you can also mix these up, like buy a bunch of these kind of pens, um, and then mix your color up at whatever consistency, whatever um, value that you want in your barrel, and then do brush calligraphy with them, or brush lettering. And I'm horrible at it, especially with the with these brush pens. I've been practicing with um, the Tombow markers and then the, I can't remember what they're called. I'll show you. The, I think it's the Pilot Touch, Pentel Touch, um, where they have the brush tip like that. Uh, so I'm used to that. I'm not used to a brush pen, but I figured I'd try it on here because a lot of people like to fill their barrels with watercolor. Um, so you can also, like, I know you've seen, like, Jane Davenport's Mermaid Markers or all of those watercolor markers out there. Um, Diane Reevely puts her dilution sprays into her, um, her little water markers to color with. You can do that also with your watercolors and use them as a coloring tool. Uh, so we're going to try to write, um, I guess, happy. Make sure I'm on camera here. It's going to be so bad because I'm not good at the brushes. Oh, it's hard to get that fine point. People who can use these brush pens to do this lettering are amazing. Because it takes a lot of control. And you see how it's fading out to a lighter color? See, like I said, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> but it's fading out to a lighter color as you go. Now, I wouldn't do that if you filled the barrel with the actual color that you wanted to be consistent throughout your entire painting. But those are some cool things that you can do with the Hydra's watercolors other than just traditional watercoloring. So you can do tons and tons of stuff with these... Um, Fine Art Hydra's Watercolors. They're amazing and very versatile and just a good art supply to have on hand, especially if you do watercolor along with mixed media and brush lettering and stuff like that. Um, if you are a very eclectic artist, artist, these are very, very good to have on hand. Um, so now what I'm going to do is sketch a little mushroom and... Um, paint it and show you, and I'm going to do it on student quality paper, so I'm just going to show you how you can still, because they are so staining, um, you can glaze and get pretty good paintings on student quality paper with these paints just because they are so staining. They don't lift up so much. Um, so I'm just going to do just a little tiny um, mushroom sketch and then paint it in, and I'll probably speed that up. Uh, and then afterwards come back and talk about everything that we've discussed, and yeah. So I'll be right back with that.
For a distant star, don't stop now. Isn't it strange to have a safe and home? To the dark out in days of fear and safe and calm. If you're gonna make a change, you have to let me know. Turn the shit around, just let it down the lungs. It's all you need to do. So this is the completed sketch that we got there. Um, so you can see that I could do the glazes and layers very well without the, the first glazes lifting up like so often happens on student quality paper which is what gives a lot of beginners trouble is the fact that the paints lift up and mix when you don't really want them to. Uh, and I didn't finish the little white caps. I figured you'd, you'd get the point and your brain would kind of fill in the rest. Um, but you can mix not only can you do that, you can um, 
glaze and stuff on cheaper paper, but also um, you can tone down the colors and get very earthy colors. I didn't have any tubes of very earthy colors except for that burnt sienna, um, but by mixing colors and mixing complements and stuff, you can see I got some pretty toned down colors. Um, and you can practice with that, and they're very good for practicing your mixing and everything um, because you really only need a little bit of the watercolor, the liquid watercolor, um, to mix around with. Um, and it's a little, it is a little bit harder mixing with these. That's why they're so great at for practicing because w once you learn to mix with these, you'll know how to mix with pretty much every other watercolor. Um, just <laughs> you'll understand it a little bit better because you've worked so hard learning with these watercolors. Or at least that's that's my opinion because I feel like they are a little bit harder to mix with um, because they are so pigmented and concentrated and you have to make sure your values are right and stuff like that. Um, but it's cool that you can take those bright, bright colors and uh, mix these more toned down colors and make a more earthy painting. So they're not just for people who like those bright, bright colors, they're also for people who like the toned down earthy colors as well. So you can do a lot of stuff with these watercolor paints. So overall I get they are top notch in my opinion. They're all light fast. Other than the fact that the ultramarine colors, the two ultramarine colors, don't actually have ultramarine. Um, the rest of the colors are pretty good. I wish they did have an original ultramarine. I don't know why they don't. Um, but uh, yeah, I wish they did. But it still works the the hue still works but if you want to have actual effects with like the granulating ultramarine although it does still granulate if you can see that not as much as the burnt sienna because that's the pigment granulating naturally um but it does still have that those granulating effects just like the ultramarine red violet which again I don't understand <laughs> so I'm gonna have to look that up but uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this review. It was probably a very long review, which is why I put the painting and everything in speed mode uh, and stopped short finishing the little white parts of the mushroom because it would have taken forever. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, and if you learned something, um, and if you liked the very thorough, thorough review, then please give me a thumbs up and click thumbs up. Um, but if you did enjoy this video and you like the fact that I did a very thorough review rather than like some other videos that are just short little segments either showing you the color or showing you how they flow or doing a small little painting with them instead of going over all of the information. Um, if you like that aspect of how I do my reviews then please give me a thumbs up and click that subscribe button and let me know what else you want to review in the comment section down below. And I will see you in the next video and I hope you all have a great week. Bye!